Hello, I'm Stuart Parkinson. I'm going to talk about science governance and, uh, and the relationship with existential risk. So, um, quick recap of what's being talked about earlier in the conference. Um, we are not in a good place. Existential risk, I won't go into any detail here, but um, the, you know, suffice to say, environmental risks climate there are things even worse than climate change biodiversity loss nitrogen pollution for example the COVID-19 death toll is frightening and increasing um, but there are other pandemics around the corner uh, against the backdrop of nuclear weapons modernization nuclear treaties are being dismantled um, and to summarize it all um, the bulletin of atomic scientists with their doomsday clock um, have pronounced it's 100 seconds to midnight and I think it's useful just to point out that even when an understanding of, of existential res risks are communicated to policymakers, that doesn't always result in adequate action and I just want to point here to this situation in the UK where we have in the national risk assessment among the top tier one risks um, is highlighted pandemics and um, and yet Britain was among the worst responding countries in, in the industrialized world um, which shows again the work that needs to be done. So how much of all this is a science governance issue? Well responsibility for understanding and tackling existential risks is dispersed among many organizations what i want for without going into a lot of detail here what i want to focus on is that the sort of science community as the body with often the most knowledge of the risks we have a responsibility to do more and arguably much more so who holds power within the government governance of science i presented here the obvious movers and shakers, the funders, the organisations that perform the research, the professional bodies that set the standards for research. Um, and in influencing the decisions made in these bodies are, is um, the role of individual scientists. We can affect these organisations often who themselves are not recognising the importance of existential risks. And um, I've presented here some examples from the UK, some figures from the UK, which give an idea of where the relative power in terms of funding lies. Now, business as, as a funder and as also a performing sector is dominant, but there's still a lot of money that's being awarded by public research bodies and um, being spent by universities. And this is where the research obviously tends to happen for existential risks, but if we can lever um, funding in some of the other sectors as well, then that can make a, a significant difference to the amount that's available to us. So this leads into my first proposal, and I've got a number of proposals for how to improve our, our situation. Um, and the first one here is, is simply and obviously more funding for research and existential risks. Um, what I've done it is tried to give an indication of what I think is a good level to um, target and um, uh, based on, on my experience of dealing with these sorts of organisations, I think arguing for something in the realm of at least 5% um, in a public science body, so for example a research council in the UK, um, we need at least 5% spent. It's not too much to ask for 5% to be spent on existential risks, on understanding and, and proposing solutions um, to existential risks. And in some cases, this could be far larger. Um, so for env um, environmental risks, for example, um, I think the spending is already higher than this amount, although detailed figures can be hard to come by. Um, and, and following the, these suggestions, um, I mean, doing the arithmetic, this would give the UK a, a total spending 
um, of around 400 million a year on understanding and, and looking for solutions for existential risks. And that's the sort of level I think we should be aiming for that might actually give us a chance to um, tackle many of the problems. And if that was repeated across the industrialized world, I think we would be in a far better place. And, and in tandem with that, we need to establish um, better dialogues between governments and researchers and having being able to command that amount of money would um, give us, uh, put us in a much more powerful position to argue that we were important enough to justify um, better, a better position and better um, recognition from government, along with the fact that we are facing existential risks um, rather more frequently than the government anticipated. Um, so how do we leverage, leverage this extra funding and influence? Well, this feeds into the remaining proposals that I want to talk about. So the first one is about more education within the profession, within the science and engineering profession on existential risks, more university courses, more training courses as part of professional development and um, uh, the road to chartership within um, various professions. Um, if we tailored the, um, the education to different science, scientific disciplines or professions, then that would make them particularly relevant. And I, arguably, they would be quite popular. I think in university, I think young people are quite um, inspired by courses on, on how to save the world or at least trying to understand how the world might be um, destroyed by our foolishness. So, um, and I think the school climate strikes here show there's a real appetite for this stuff. So doing as much of this as we can. And on the professional side, um, recognizing the role of international treaties, for example, arms control treaties um, in the, the need to be aware of, of these treaties and the obligations and how they affect professions is, is a route in to um, um, more education work in this area through that route. Um, the third proposal is around improving science communication and there are so many options here um, where I think we could engage as researchers. Um, the doomsday clock that I mentioned earlier, I think is too simplistic. It's trying to take too many risks and, and fit them into a one dimensional device. So um, let's take a, a leaf out of some of the um, planetary boundaries work. And um, what I'm going to suggest in a second is, is warning light system. Um, we also need some more public facing science conferences. So it's great that we're doing an event like this, but I think it's really important that we do more of these events to the public, make them more high profile by working in tandem with some of the national academies like the Royal Society, for example. And if we do them online, then we don't have to fly and we don't contribute to the existential risk of climate change. Um, I think also, activities and displays of public science festivals, fairs, museums. There's enormous scope here. Um, I visit science museums quite frequently just for fun. And it, it makes me sad how few of them actually take any of these issues very seriously, even ones that have public recognition like climate change. Um, the potential for collaborating with science fiction authors, I think is enormous. Um, a lot of science fiction has poor science in it. Um, and um, building those links is key. And um, another area, another initiative is something called the Science Oath for Climate, which I'll, I'll talk about a bit more in a second. Um, but the important thing here is to inspire action, not hopelessness or complacency. And there's, there's a whole lot written in environmental psychology around this. And, and I think we need to draw on that expertise. Um, so to give you an example of what I mean by a warning light system, it, it's not rocket science. Um, it's quite straightforward, sort of five level indicator like the one on the right. Um, an overall rating for each existential risk and the, the urgency of global action. And then these could be further refined, developed, expanded um, for looking at global risk levels during the next five, 10 years, for example, or the adequacy of, of response at a national level. Um, 
partnership with national academies would help raise the profile and we need to draw on the good experience where um, um, in areas like environmental risk where the, these indicators have been used well not the um, poor experience um, for example in the UK we have a UK terrorism threat level and um, they use names rather than colors or non numbers and um, nobody knows whether a severe risk level is higher than a substantial risk level. So we don't want to follow their example. Um, the Science Safe for Climate is an initiative that the Scientists for Global Responsibility has just launched. And it's really aimed at trying to um, encourage scientists to speak out more publicly, both about the scale of the risk, but also the scale of the action needed to tackle it and particularly when it's politically difficult because a lot of things on we find are being said in private but not being said in public about the scale of action necessary and particularly in terms of things like economic reform and behavior change of the wealthy um, and an important element of this is to take personal action um, so reducing your carbon emissions and showing leadership through, through that route and um, encouraging your um, professional bodies and employers, institutions to follow this lead as well um, and, and demonstrate um, what can be done. And the final proposal is around, is arguably the most challenging, but it's also terribly important, is to curb the influence of those organisations which are fueling existential risks um, and the two most prominent examples I can think of are, are the fossil fuel industry and the nuclear arms industry and um, but there are others um, but these are the two I think we should focus on and what's what we argue is that um, a tobacco industry style boycott for these sectors is what we need. Um, if you've got science communication that's being done involving fossil fuel, major fossil fuel companies or major nuclear arms companies, then this really muddies. This is a way that these organizations can deflect criticism for the way in which they are fueling and contributing to the problem. Um, and trying to avoid research collaboration as well. Again, this is another way of deflecting um, criticism. And a couple of examples from, again, from the UK, the Atomic Weapons Establishment has spent a lot of time and money on its technical outreach program. So that it reaches into uh, nearly half the universities in the UK. Um, this is a serious issue when Britain is deploying um, well, Britain has, has around 200 nuclear weapons and is deploying 40 of them at any one time. Um, and another issue is around the way in which um, nuclear weapons companies are collaborating in sponsorship of the main science, the largest science education event in the country. And again, there are, there are real issues about um, conflicts of interest and, and um, and green, well greenwash it's not quite environmental but greenwash in a different way um ethical wash if you like um and and does this sort of money in research and and um science communication events is is that response is that the reason why the uk science communication the science community barely talks about nuclear weapons risks that's our our concern so to recap some recommendations to scientists. So speaking out more publicly about existential risks using, there's a lot of creative um, options here that can be used. Um, it's important to try and use, use the options available, develop better ones. Um, we also need to challenge funding from organizations that are making existential risks worse. Um, and particularly in science funding, science research area. Um, we need to expand education activities through universities and professional bodies and um, lobby funding bodies to support more research and education in these areas. And through these routes, we can then build better links with policymakers. Thank you very much.